good. I could never thank him enough. You know, I couldn't sit down on the Lord. When I woke up this morning, I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my church family. Thank you for my regular family. Everybody doing fine? It could be worse. Y'all ain't feeling it. But see, God is good, and we ought to be up giving him the praise. He done brought us from a lot, a mighty long way. Brought us through a lot of things. And we're going to sit down on God. How dare you? He's good. Now, I know some people can't stand up. I know God is worth everybody. I ought to be able to clap for Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't get enough of thinking. I done had some blessings this week. My lights wasn't cut off. He made a way. Yeah, that's what my God does. He makes a way for me. I've never seen the righteous forsake. I thank you, Lord. Oh, yeah, this is serious business. You might not like me, but that's okay. I love you. I know we serve an awesome God. And I know he's done something for everybody in here. Now just think about it. Put your hands together. Mm, I thank you, Lord. And I praise you, Lord, Lord. cause you've been so good. good. Yeah, yeah, he's been so good. good And he's been a doctor. He's been been a lawyer. And he's been my heart. heart. He made a way. way He made the blind to see. see. Even made. Lord, I praise the Lord, cause it's been so good, so good to me. Yeah, 
thank you, Lord. this morning. Pleasant Green, this is one of our new members. I want everybody to take a, a good look at their new brother in Christ Jesus. And, 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 and the wrong you you keep this in mind, that you are just as much as part of this church and this fellowship as anybody who's been here 30 or 40 years. You understand? Yes. You're you just as important. At this time, I would like to present to you your certificate of baptism. And then also, um, Brother Jerome, you know, as, as we walk through this life, this physical life, we need nourishment for our physical body. Then also, now you are in the new spiritual life, and, and, and you need nourishment for that. So here I am presenting to you the Word of God. And then, Amen. Jerome, take this and study it prayerfully. Go where the Word is being taught, Sunday school, Bible classes, because you as a father, and the man in your house, it is your responsibility for you to know the word so that you can teach your family, your young sons, yeah. all right, and, and, and your wife about the word, okay? And then also, we hide the word in our heart that, so that we might not sin against God. And so this is what's going to give you strength because the enemy, he, he going to attack you, okay? But but you have the word of God. Put on the whole arm of God, which is his word. Study it, learn it, and you find that you love it. God bless you. Mighty man, glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory of glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Amen. And then let's go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 13, 14, and 15, we're going to, we want to highlight those three verses, but we're going to look at the whole parable that is given here by Jesus. Verses 13, 14, and 15. All right. I was trying to see whether that's corresponding with uh, what I'm reading in my Bible. Okay, let us begin at verse 13. 
but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong, did if not thou agree with me for a penny, take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So in this, the reading of those three verses, you may be seated. I was struggling with uh, trying to tie in from this parable the uh, basic truths that God is lifting here and trying to give it a uh, theme of thought that would cover all of it. And certain, certain thoughts came to me, but I wasn't satisfied with it. I'm really not satisfied with this one, but anyway, I guess it will suffice as well as any. And let's, let's send our thinking around, God gives, but he doesn't pay. God gives, but he doesn't pay. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. God gives, but he never pays. In order to understand and to give, have some background behind the story that... Uh, Jesus begins here in chapter 20. You got to go back and read chapter 19. But that was a uh, rich young man that came to Jesus and asked Christ a question, well, what can I do? And notice, underline the word, what can I do to uh, gain or to get eternal life. And then Jesus responded to him by saying, do this, do that, etc., etc." And then love your neighbor as yourself. And then the young man responded by saying, well, I've done all of this. What more can I do? Then he said, all of your possessions, all of your riches, sell everything that you have, distribute it to those that are poor that need it, and then come and follow me. And Matthew says, when the young man heard this, I guess we can say that he just hung his head and just walked away silently, which in his walking away and bowing his head indicated that he was not at that moment willing to do what Christ had asked him to do, to give up everything that he had amassed and accumulated. And then after, after he walked away, Jesus made the statement, he said, it's, it is easier, and, and this is what we call a figure of speech, it is easier for a camel, you know how large a camel is, to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was not saying it is impossible, but what he was pointing up to the disciples is that most people that have a mass things and stuff, it is very difficult by human nature to give up my stuff and then to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. When he said that, I'm sure the disciples, they were thinking, well now, if, 
if Jesus said that to him, now we have turned to lose everything. So now, what are we going to get out of this venture? So Peter, as usual, always spoke for the others and said, Lord, now, now we, have, we have dropped everything in our lives. We have abandoned our families and everything to follow you. Now, what are we going to get out of what we have sacrificed for? And that's a good question, because there are times I think that all of us may be unconsciously asked the question, since I've done all of this, Lord, how are you going to bless me? We just say it differently, but when you boil it down, it's about the same thing. I've, I've been faithful. Uh, I've done this. I've done that for you. Uh, I've tried to be obedient to what I thought was your will for my life. Now, after doing this for so many years, Lord, it looks like that my life ought to be blessed a little bit better than what it is. Or if it looks like you've been comparing yourself with somebody else who doesn't attend church, who espouses the fact that they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they live a reckless life, but yet they seem to flourish, have no problems, and look like things just easily fall in their lap. And here you have sacrificed everything, and you're still struggling. Lord, um, how are you going to bless me? What are you going to do about my sacrifices? Or maybe to say it another way, what I have committed myself to and given up in my life, have I wasted my time? Are you lying when you say that those who turn their backs on father, mother, sister, brother, family, and et cetera, that they will be rewarded a hundredfold? After Peter poses this question, Jesus, in order for Peter to understand what the kingdom of God really is, and it's not rewarding on the basis of work done, he tells a story beginning in chapter 20. And the story goes like this. There was a land owner, had many acres of land, and uh, needed extra workers, let's say, to pick the grapes uh, off the vines in all of his many acres. So one day he goes out at 6 o'clock, and he hires some workers that are standing there in the city square and these were migrant workers hoping that somebody would hire them for the day because that's how they lived and that's how they put bread on the table by uh, waiting to be hired day after day to go into somebody's field and which if you know if you're familiar with it that practice is still done today and then at 9 o'clock, he went back to the same place and hired some more. 12 o'clock, he went back and hired some more. 3 o'clock, he went back and hired some more workers. Then at 5 o'clock, he went back the last time and hired some workers. Now, the ones that he hired at the beginning of the day, he told them, he said, whatever is right, whatever we agree upon, I will pay you. So they agreed upon in terms of denarius a day 
for their day's work, which would be enough to buy food for their family. The ones that he hired almost before the day was over with, we assume that he made the same deal with them. So when it was quitting time at 6 o'clock that evening, he told his um, superintendent, the man that was over the workers, he said, call all of them in so that everybody can be paid. So he started with the ones that were hired last first. And the ones that had only been working just a couple of hours, he paid them a day's wages. So the ones that had been working all day long from six that morning under the hot sun, bearing all of the heat and backs were tired and sore, when they saw the ones that only worked just a short time being paid one day's wage, they thought to themselves, oh, <laughs> if they got paid for one day, we've been here all day long. Man, you, you could almost, almost see them drooling at the mouth. I know we're going to get much more than that and we're going to get a whole lot. But when it got to them, they got the same thing, the ones that had not been working but a couple of hours. And they had been there all day long. Now, according to the laws of economics, that doesn't make sense, does it? For what employer nowadays would pay, let's say if you were the manager of a um, McDonald's or Burger King, and you had some persons to come in and to work, let's say from 10 at night to 12 midnight, and you paid them, let's say, $20. And then the next morning you had something to come in at 6 o'clock and get off at 4 o'clock and you paid them $20. And the ones that worked all day found out about the ones the night before that only worked two hours and they get $20 too. How do you think they would feel? They would be a little bit irritated. Why? because they would feel as though more work deserves what? More pay. And that makes sense according to our human calculation, right? For the more you do, the more you should be rewarded. Amen? But this parable is not about equity. This parable is not about unfair labor wages because if those workers, if you put this parable into today's setting, the ones that had worked all day long, they would, they would be on a picket line. They would be protesting against the management, right? and they would, they would have on their signs unfair labor practice, right? God doesn't see life the way that man does. This parable is simply about one word and you can write it down. It is about grace, G-R-A-C-E, 
C-E. Have you ever heard that word before? Grace. There are several things that I think that this parable lives. But I think two things in a negative way that this parable indicates is that this story which implies grace offends man's sense of fairness. Amen? Grace never mixes well with what we feel should be fair in our lives. All of us at one time or another, we, we might even murmur this. We will say life is not fair. But have you ever known a time when life was fair? Was there ever a time in your life that things went the way that you thought they ought to go? Does God ever plan things in our lives the way that we have mapped it out in our minds? No. Therefore, sometimes we get angry with God because we feel as though that God is not what? Dealing fairly with us. And there's something else that comes across in this story. Forgiveness comes across in this story as condoning wrong. That God forgives wrong and does not reward right. Amen. Now I said that this parable lifts one word, and that is grace. And there are four questions that we want to look at in this parable, and prayerfully we can understand a little bit more deeply the heart of God as it relates to His grace. And notice I said, grace doesn't come from us, does it? It comes from what? The heart of God. The first question I think that is applicable here is how does grace work? How does grace work? Grace works through a giving love. Grace works through a giving love. On the surface, admittedly, grace does not make sense to the human mind because what God does for everybody, most of us would not do for a few folk. I know I wouldn't, and I think if all of us were truthful and forthright, and if we admit it that was down deep in our hearts, there will be some things that God does we would not do. But when we think about it, if we think or feel that God shouldn't do it to other folk, reverse the table and then ask yourself the question, should God do the same for me? Do I deserve all of his goodness? Do I deserve his love? Do I deserve God's kindness and generosity, his graciousness? Have I, am I such a good person that God can't help himself but what? Reward me for all the work that I've done in his kingdom and what I've done in his name. If my work in the kingdom of God is motivated by what I have done so that God will recognize it and other people will be cognizant of it, then that means my motive is wrong. 
God does not reward uh, motives that are selfish, that center around the individual themselves. For Jeremiah, the scripture that we read, he wanted the people to know that whatever is done, if it's not done to highlight me in your life, if it's not done to give me glory, then it's done for the wrong reason. Nothing that you do should be done to bring and to draw attention to you. Why? Because what you are and what you got, you had nothing to do with it. I did it all. Amen? I made you. I have blessed you with everything that you have, even though you are not aware of it. So there is nothing, even what you wear, what you think, what you have, your family around you, your job, your acquaintances, all of that is because of what? My grace and what I have done in your life. Now, if you notice that when I made that statement, how it was very reluctant for most of us to say amen. Why? Again, because it offends us to think that we got to depend on God for everything. We want to think that we had something to do with it. Amen? That's because of sin in our lives. Why do you think Satan was able to uh, appeal to uh, Eve and then to Adam in terms of disobeying God? He appealed to their, what, nature of self. Self can do this. Self can accomplish this. So let self move forward. And then they found out that self can't do what self wants to do. There are things in your life and my life that even though we might think it or desire it, but if it is not in the plan and in the eternal purpose of God, it will not come to pass. Let me ask another question. How many of us here this morning have mapped out something reasonably in your mind and then God threw it, as so to speak, tore up the blueprint, threw it in the trash can, and then replaced it with a whole new plan in your life? How many of you have ever had that to happen? And those of you who didn't raise your hand, he did it for you too. You just don't want to admit it. That's all. And that's that stubbornness that's in our spirits. We don't want to admit that God is good. So how does grace work? It works through a giving love. A love that, well, we say that grace, what? Is the unmerited favor of God. What literally does that mean? It means that what God does for me and in my life, I don't deserve it. I didn't ask for it. I'm not good enough to receive it, but God gives it anyway. Amen? Now, if God does this anyway in my life, it comes from his spirit and his heart of what? Love. And it's a love that I don't understand, a love that you don't understand, but thank God for his love of grace. Because if it wasn't for that, all of us would be in the stew. Amen? Question number two. What rules does grace use? What rules does grace use? And responding to that, grace uses the rules of divine love. Not man's rule, but God's rule. The wages of sin is what? But God's what? Is what? God never pays a wage. I want, I want us to let that soak into our thing, into our heart. God never pays a wage. God gives a gift, but he never pays a wage. 
because when you, when, when you say that God pays a wage, you are saying that God owes me something that I've worked for. And you and I can never work for anything that God gives on his own that he wants us to have. Breath, life, strength, God gives that. He doesn't pay us for it. Listen to what I just said. Does God pay you to breathe? Does he pay you to see? Does he pay you to hear? Does he pay you to walk? Does he say, oh, goody, goody, goody. They are doing so well and so fine. I'm so proud of them. I'm going to pay them something for what they have done. What can I pay you today, Bonner? What is it that you want that I owe you? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? The hymn writer said, if I had a thousand tongues to do what? If I had a thousand tongues to do what? Would that be enough to thank him? No. If I had 10,000 tongues, still wouldn't be enough. Why? Because anything that I do cannot in kind repay God for what he's already done, what he's doing now, and what he promises he will do. Can't do it. You can't keep up with him. Because when you go one mile, he'll go ten. When you go one inch, he'll go several feet and that's the reason why because he will never be in our debt but we will always be in his debt for by grace I am saved it is the gift of God not of my works because if it was my works, what would happen? Because of my sinful nature, I would be what? Boasting. I would be bragging about it. Look what I did. But it is a gift. And God makes certain that you and I can't brag about doodly squat. He ain't gonna let me brag. Because everything that he does is because he loves me. So the rule that he uses, he uses his divine love. And you and I can't measure up. I don't care if we lived as long as Methuselah and did, if we were able to do perfect works, we still can measure up to his divine standard of love. In fact, Scripture tells us that we don't become perfect in this life anyway. We work on it. We work toward it. He works through us, but it is never what? Accomplished on this side of the tears. When is it culminated? When we get out of this mess here and we're in his presence, then that's when what? He climaxes it. And we what? Become just like him. Question number three. What is the objective of grace? What is the objective of grace? What is the goal of grace? What does grace hope to accomplish by doing this? Answer. To bring the recipient into a God relationship. Who is the recipient? We are. A recipient is the one that is given, that receives the gift. And why does he do it? In order that he and I, what? Become what? Divinely connected uh, and bonded together so that in that relationship I realize that he is my father I am his son, and without him, uh, 
There's nothing that I can do on my own. But like Paul said, uh, in his strength, in his power, what? I can do what? Everything, anything. But in my own puny, weak strength, I cannot accomplish anything. You remember what happened to Paul in his experience in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter? And Paul, you remember, had that thorn in the flesh, and it doesn't matter what it was, but whatever it was, it was something that drained him, maybe mentally, physically, spiritually, I don't know. But it was an irritation in his life. Let's say it like that. So he went to God, what? And three times, and, and, and even though he says, I went to God and prayed three times, that doesn't mean tonight, tomorrow night, and night after that, you know. But three times, he approached God and asked God for one thing. If you take the thorn away, if you get rid of this irritation, Lord, I can really do some great work for you. Man, I can burn up the forest. I will be just like a buzzsaw. And God's response was, I'm not going to remove the irritation because I don't want you to be a buzz saw on your own. I want to buzz the saw through you. So I'm going to leave the irritation there, which means that you're going to have to depend on me and my power and my strength to use you to accomplish what I want to accomplish in you. And that's what God does in your life and my life. Somebody here has a physical weakness, a mental weakness, spiritual weakness. All of us have some kind of debilitating problem. But in spite of that, if you put it in God's hands, God can do more with your weakness than you can with your strength. Did you know that? Paul said, my goal in life is to know the power of what? His resurrection and the fellowship, what? Of his suffering. Now, you can't leave out the suffering. Everybody wants power, but nobody wants to suffer. Everybody wants it good, Nobody wants it bad. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody what wants to be a disciple for God to use to get there. We always want the best, and we feel as though we are entitled to the best. And Reverend Harden, give him the worst, but let me keep the best. That's a selfish nature. Finally, What is our reward from God's grace? Number one, how does grace work? Number two, what are the rules that grace uses? Number three, what is the objective of grace? And number four, finally, what is our reward for letting God use us? I think that's a fitting question. Don't you think so? In verse 13, can you put that back up on the screen again for me, Lynette? In verse 13, I want to show you something. Chapter 20. Let's go, okay. Scroll, scroll back up to verse 13. But he answered, one of them and said, friend, I do thee what? Did you not agree with me for a penny? Okay, that 13th verse implies God's justice. I did not do you no wrong. I did not commit an injustice to you. Did we not agree at 6 o'clock this morning? You said you would work for this. I said I would give you that. Did I not keep my word? 
Does not God keep his word? Well, what are you complaining about? Crying and grumbling, talking about this ain't fair. This shouldn't happen to me. What have I done to deserve this? Did he not say that he would take care of you? Did he not say? Now, now, now he didn't tell me how he was going to do it, right? He just said he was going to take care of me. But you see, because I'm so nosy, I want to know, well, Lord, how are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Where are you going to do it? Who are you going to, you, who, who are you going to do it through? And God said, it ain't none of your business. I told you I would take care of you. I'll keep my word. I'm just and I'm fair. But no, we got to know heaven's blueprint before we get to heaven. God puts up with so much with us, you and me both. Okay, I, Lynette, I ain't through, girl. Give me back the scriptures again. I'll tell you when I'm through. Okay, verse 14. Okay, take down the best resolution. Okay. Verse 14 says, take that thine is, or take what is yours, right? And go your way. And I will give unto this last, even as unto you. That verse lifts up grace. I have the right to do with and to give to those who came in the last hour just as long as I give you what we agreed upon, right? If I don't cheat you, it's my money, right? My business. So, in other words, I, I always like to if I was in God's shoes. It really ain't none of your cotton-picking business what I do with my own money. That's my money. Have I cheated you? You got your money. Now what I want to give to other folk ain't none of your business. You ain't giving nothing away. You getting. Can I give to others so they can get? Can I bless Stanley, even though you may not like Stanley or think much about Stanley? Now, it's all right to bless the pastor because he's your interpreter, he's your preacher. But how come I can't bless Stanley if I want to? That ain't none of the pastor's business. Why don't you say amen? Because you know that's the attitude that we have. They think they are so much. Look like, you know, I, they get on my nerves. Every time I look around, they always flaunting in terms of talking about how God has blessed them. Big deal. Why are you talking about it? You don't know their motive behind sharing a uh, praise blessing with you? Are you saying that they are doing it to make you jealous? That's stupid. They may be sharing it to encourage you, to let you know that God hadn't forgotten about you. You remember that story? That was not a story. You remember the incident, the experience? I, 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 made, I made mention of this maybe several years ago. When I was in Chattanooga, you remember me telling you about something that happened to me and how I got jealous of another young man, another minister? You remember me sharing that with you? Well, for those of you who don't remember, this happened way back 30, 40 years ago when I was more stupider than I am stupid now. Because don't none of us ever reach the point that we are brilliant, you know, but hopefully as you get older, you. You know, a lot of your stupidity 
hopefully you can put it in the trash can and you're not as stupid. But anyway, uh, when I was younger and when you are in your youth, you get caught up in the culture of climbing, you know, succeeding, success. And sometimes you get jealous of your peers if you see them rising quickly and here you are sweating and, and working two and three jobs and look like you ain't going nowhere and then you wonder to yourself, now what is it that they got and I ain't got? And then you start comparing your gifts, you know, well I can do this, they don't have the mind that I have. Why is it God blesses them and don't bless me? I had that stupid attitude to come over me one time. Young minister, close friend of mine, I even married him and his wife. He was pastoring a small church. And one Tuesday in, in the minister's union, he had been called, secret where nobody knew anything about it, he had been called to a church in Fort Worth, Indiana. And the chairman of the deacon board he drove down anyway. He came down to make that announcement in the ministerial meeting that we had. And when he made the announcement, you know, everybody was clapping and saying, God bless you, you know. And I'm standing there. <laughs> he just got in the ministry. He ain't even, he ain't even suffered no time. He, I've been suffering all these years. How come, Lord, you ain't advanced me? And don't tell me, none of y'all is exempt from it, because if you do, you're lying to yourself. And I became negative. And I thought to myself, why him? What has he done? And the more I thought about it, the more negative I got. And other ministers were going, going, going up to him, God bless you, we love you, we're praying for you. I'm standing back there. I ain't going up there. I ain't congratulating him for nothing. He don't deserve it. If anything, I deserve it. But the Lord taught me a painful lesson that Tuesday morning. And while I was pouting, Sister Beard, and thinking about what I was going through, what I had labored for, what I deserved, why didn't God elevate me over against this little young upstart, this little whippersnapper, just coming in and ain't done much. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Sometimes God has to cut your heart. He has to bleed that selfishness out of your spirit in order for you to be brought, like the prodigal son, to be brought back to your senses. And the Holy Spirit said, hold it. You ain't got no business being jealous of him. That's God's business. God's got something for you. Don't worry about when you're going to, when you're going to inherit it. You just let God work it out. You rejoice with him. You be glad for him. And the more I thought about it, then all of a sudden that that selfish spirit started to dissipate, started to evaporate. And then I was able to say, Lord, yeah, 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 you are right. I should be rejoicing with him. Because Daddy had told me what God has for you, no man can keep it from you. But I had forgotten about that. Because I'm comparing me with you get where I'm going. But once I stop comparing Sister Harden and just thank God that he blessed him that he what? 
promoted him, that he laid his hands on him, then a different spirit came over me at that point. And I started to realize and that ain't good. That ain't the right spirit that God wants me to have. And I had to say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. What God get for you, even Satan can't stop it from coming in your life. You hear what I said? And don't get anxious about in terms of when it's going to come. And then don't try to figure out where it's going to come from. And then don't get jealous of somebody else and you try to, you try to equate yourself with them and how long they have not been or what they don't exemplify but what God has given you. Don't worry about that. You just be faithful. Serve God. And believe me, I tell you, God will repay. Now let's go to the last verse. Verse 15. Lynette, you did it again. I told you I ain't through. I'll tell you when I'm through. <laughs> Verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is your eye evil because I am good? The sovereignty of God. I can do with mine what I want to do. This ain't yours. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. I do with the cattle what I want to. I made the hills. The hills are mine. I do with the hills what I want to. The grass I put on the hills belong to me. I do with my grass what I choose to do. I'm God. You ain't nothing but a puny bag of dust. I can breathe on you and your life is gone like that. You came from dust and now you're going back to dust. I was talking with a member of the other yesterday and we were talking about how many times, okay, Lynette, I'm through. You can take it off. I'm through. So many times we get caught up in stuff and we pri while we are living, we prize stuff. How many suits you got? How many pair of shoes you got? Ladies, how many pocketbooks you got? How many dresses you got? How many wigs you got? <laughs> and all this other stuff, you know. And, 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 and you feel a sense, without being aware of it, you feel a sense of being, well, you know, I got a few more than what you got. But you know, when you die and somebody else takes over your stuff, it really ain't important then. Because let, 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 let me tell you what happens with stuff. My sister called me up day four yesterday, Rem Harden, and uh, she had put all my mother's stuff in a, um, what you call those units, those uh, storage units, right? Mama's stuff. Now to mama, this was precious stuff. See what I'm saying? Stuff she had accumulated over the years, memories from daddy and family and pictures and all this kind of stuff. So I, I, I asked my sister, I said, uh, did you finish cleaning out the unit? She said, yeah. I think she said it took her about a whole week. I, and she said, half of that stuff that mama had, she said I had to give it to the goodwill and, and someone had to just dump it in the trash can. It wasn't worth keeping. So she sent me some of mama's stuff. <laughs> Listen to me now. Now, Mama is in, she's with the Lord now. And Mama had 
uh, the stuff that my sister sent me. There were some pictures of my graduation and when I came here and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Anisha when she was at Harriet Stowe and I read some of the stuff, you know, and it brought back precious memories. But after I got through reading it, it ended up being stuff. And you know what I did? I put it in another box. And most likely my children, when I'm dead and gone, they'll possibly throw it in the trash can because it will have no meaning to them at all. It's just stuff. And we get looped and tied and bonded and, and we get super glued to stuff. Stuff can't save your soul. In fact, stuff is what it is. It's stuff. You got to leave, you got to leave stuff. And even if you're here, stuff will leave you. Because you hang around long enough, that, jer that dress or suit that you are wearing, you get tired of it, don't you? You put on weight, it gets too tight. You lose a lot of weight, it hangs on you. So you got to get some more stuff. Or you get tired of the stuff you got. So you start to piling on more stuff. Not that you need more stuff, but because you get tired of looking at the stuff you already got. And then one day, when you're cleaning out your stuff, the garage or the attic, then you start to realize, my Lord, I didn't realize how much stuff I had. And then you start to realize that a lot of this stuff I should have discarded a long time ago. Why did I keep this stuff here? Why did I keep that stuff there? So you start to what? Throwing stuff in the trash can. And then you come to one stuff that has a lot of memories and something says, oh, oh no, don't you throw that one in the trash can. Hold on to that stuff. That's important stuff. And then you tell yourself, well, maybe later on I might need this stuff. So I'll keep this stuff just in case if I need it. Then five years later, you come right back across the same stuff that you thought you would need down the line, and you get ready to throw it away again. And some said, no, 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 hold on to that stuff. You might need that stuff five more years from now. And then when I die, somebody else throws my stuff in the trash can because it has no meaning to them, none whatsoever. Stuff. We get hung up, and can I say this jokingly? We get hung up in apples. You didn't catch that, did you? It is said, but we don't know, that Adam and Eve ate the apple in the garden. We don't know, the scripture doesn't say it was an apple. They just ate some fruit. But verbally, folks say it was an apple. So I'm just saying, figuratively speaking, we get, we love apples. And we ain't satisfied with one apple, we want to get a bushel of apples. And then after the bushel, then we want to get two or three bushels of apples. I like to look at life in reality. One day, my stuff will have to be decided by my children and what stuff they want to keep and what stuff they want to get rid of. And my wife was telling me the other day, she called herself going in my study, cleaning out my stuff. I got mad. I got angry. I said, take your hands off of my stuff. This is important stuff. Don't bother it. I will decide what's good stuff and what's bad stuff. And all I did was put all the stuff right back in the same place. That's us. 
From Davis Hamilton, you done the same thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what you say? Oh, okay. Reverend David said, leave my stuff alone. That's what I told my wife, but I didn't tell her like that. But I said, I said, baby, I said, let me handle my stuff. And that's right, I want to tell her, take your cotton-picking hands off of my stuff. I know what stuff I want to get rid of and what stuff I want to hold on to. Grace. Grace. Say it with me. Grace. Grace. John Newton said, it was grace what that woke me up. Grace what? And it was grace that taught my what? And grace what? My fears relieved. How precious did that grace what? Appear the hour I first believed. When we have been there, what? Ten bright shining as the sun, we were what? It will be just like we just got there. No less days, what? To sing his great praise than when we first started the day that he saved us. That's the reason why we thank God. We thank him because it keeps our pride from getting bigger. And we thank him because he rightfully deserves the praise. Not me, but him. And when he uses me and he allows me to see his results through me, I can't feel good and say, look what I did, I may not verbalize it, but I will be thinking it. All I can do is say all praises and all honor goes to God the Father. Thank you for using me. You didn't have to think about me. You could have used somebody else. Grace. Grace. Don't ever forget grace in your life. Don't ever let Satan make you feel cocky and arrogant. But thank God daily for his grace, for his sovereignty, for his justice, for his mercy. He didn't have to do what he did in the story. And Reverend uh, Davis, that weeds back into what you told Jerome. Jerome? Jerome! Weeds back into what Reverend uh, Davis told you. Reverend Davis told you that you have all the rights and privileges of this church as a member who has been here 50 and 60 years. A person can deny the grace of God all of their lives and at the 11th hour accept Christ. They'll get in the kingdom just as quick as one who accepted Christ when they were 9 or 10 years of age. It doesn't matter. God, tenure does not impress God. What impresses him, what? Is a heart of love a heart of thankfulness, a heart of gratitude. Now the question is this, what reward do you get? And that reward is living with him eternally. That reward is being a part of his eternal plan now in this life. That reward is letting him use you daily. That reward is walking with him every day of your life. That reward is your spirit being refreshed, your mind being saturated with his wisdom, and his love engulfing you and extending that love to other people in their lives so that those who don't know love, where their life is empty 
and dry, then through you he can fill their reservoir with his divine love. The choir is going to give us an invitational song now. And somebody is possibly thinking in their minds, how do I acquire this grace? Where do I get it from? I'm glad you asked that question. You don't get it. Is given to you. You can't find it because it's already found you. You don't do anything. You just accept it. You thank God that he can save your soul. You thank God that Jesus Christ, his son, died on a cross so that he keeps on giving. What is that? That uh, that card company, Hallmark, Hall, Hallmark cards that say Hallmark. They just keep on giving and giving. Well, Hallmark will reach a point. It's going to give out. If the company collapses, Hallmark won't be giving no more. But Jesus keeps on what? Giving, giving. You can't exhaust. His will of love. His will of love is inexhaustible. It is eternal. And if you don't believe me, then just listen to what he says. If I am lifted up from the earth, I, not man, I will draw what? All men unto me. He has the power to lift. He has the power to draw. I don't. I need him to do it in my life. I can't save my soul. I cannot guarantee me that I am able to bond a relationship with God. All I can do is just say, Lord, I repent of my sins. I thank you for your love. Help me, help me, Father, to do your will, your way, in your strength and in your power. And then when you do that, Scripture tells us he'll have mercy on you. He will pardon you. And he will give you a new life. He will make you a son or a daughter in his kingdom. He will do you like the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son, when he went back to his father, he said, I don't want to be reinstated in sonship. Just put me in servantship to wait on you. And the father said, no, no, you will not be a servant. You left a son, you're going to come back. You're going to still be a son. I'm not going to demote you from sonship to servantship, but I'm going to keep you in sonship. 